This is John Steele reporting on Adventure. The quietest place in New York City is the Explorers Club. I make it my first stop whenever I make the mistake of coming home. Now, this doesn't happen very often, my coming home, I mean. And every time I do land in these United States, well, uh, anyway, I call this transcribed yarn the balloon. I was in New York and had taken refuge in the Explorers Club. A lot of my pals were there, and we were talking about faraway places with strange-sounding names while drinking hot tea out of thick china mugs and eating unleavened African bread, which made everybody feel right at home. At home? <laughs> Who am I kidding? One look around the club and you got the feeling the members just didn't know what to do with themselves in New York. New York had already been discovered, explored, and settled. And the nearest thing to a jungle was a department store. But it was nice to be back home for a while, so long as I didn't have to stay too long. I was idly scanning the newspaper, and I happened to notice a rather odd item. It was worded very simply and to the point. Wanted. Unattached man of good appearance. Must be 38 and of adventurous background. Applicant need not apply unless he has courage. Call Twining 90607 promptly at 6 p.m. today. I read the advertisement over a couple of times, and since I had nothing to lose, except my mind, I decided to put in a call. It was a few minutes to six. an advertisement in the newspaper, I think. Oh, yes. Who are you? The name's Steele. John Steele. What is your profession, Mr. Steele? Uh, let's say I move around from place to place. Please give me some reference. Uh, Explorers Club suit you? Ah, good, good. Okay, what's the pitch? In time, Mr. Steele. In time. Uh, who are you, anyhow? You will learn that in due time. Oh, I see. I will give you another telephone number. Go ahead. Uh, plus a four... Four, four, six, seven. Mm-hmm. When do I call that number? At once. Who do I say sent me? I see what you mean, chum. That's always a good start. Who is this? Suppose I introduce myself. Well? I'm John Steele. A friend gave me this number to call. <laughs> How nice of your friend. Yeah, I'm beginning to think so. Well, who was this friend, Mr. Steele? You tell me. Look, I'm not too amused by all this, you know. <laughs> me? I'm just curious. <laughs> all right, let's say I'm curious, too. That puts us in a common plane. Do you know a bar called the Antwerp? Not offhand, but I'll find it. Meet me there at the bar in half an hour. How will I know you? You'll know me. Ah, you could be right. The one alarming aspect of this deal was that I had to leave the safety of the Explorers Club and venture into the streets of New York. I decided on a cab and hoped for the best. Every time the cab crossed an intersection, I closed my eyes and waited for sudden death. But I went on living, and the cab took me to the Antwerp Bar, a very ritzy and cozy place where tired businessmen were able to discuss stock market details with their efficient secretaries. At one end of the bar, I spotted a mink coat. It was worn by a redhead who stared at me as I came in. I figured she was my date. I could be wrong, but haven't we met before? Is that the best you can do? <laughs> do I have to do better? A girl just can't sit at a bar these days, can she? You seem to be sitting at one. You have your nerve, do you know that? Well, don't we have a date? I didn't make a date with anybody. Uh, my mistake. Oh, don't go away. Why not? I just told you I don't have a date. But I do have one. 
Why don't you offer a girl a drink? <laughs> You've got one. <laughs> well, then, I'll take a champagne cocktail with you. What's your name? John Steele. Stick around, Johnny. I'm beginning to think I should. If your date doesn't show up, we can have dinner. Let me know when you're hungry. <laughs> I like you, Johnny. Mr. John Steele? Is there a Mr. John Steele here? Over here. Telephone call, sir. Did you take it in the booth? Yeah. Excuse me. I won't go away. Hello? Mr. Steele? Yeah. You know who I am. Not yet. Mr. Steele, I want you to look at the number of the phone you are using. Will you do that? Okay. Do you recognize the number? The one I called last time I talked to you. Exactly. Well, what about it? I simply wanted to save you the trouble of trying to trace the number. Oh, I see. That's all for now, Mr. Steele. Look, uh, who's this red-headed dame that I... This is getting monotonous. I missed you, Johnny. I bet you did. I ordered two steaks, all right? I like mine rare. I was sure you did. I ordered it rare. I like mine medium. You picked out a nice table, too. Cozy, isn't it? What's your name? Grace. Grace Whitehead. Ah, the name doesn't add up. <laughs> That's very cute. Well, I used to be a blonde. Okay, I'll play it your way. Play what? What happens when we're through dinner? Do you have time to go up to Irvington? Where's that? Along the river. What's waiting at Irvington? Some friends of mine. Would you like to go? Do you have a car? I have one, but you'll have to drive it. I'm not a very good driver. <laughs> Parkway's are nice in the winter, aren't they? Yeah. You ever been on this one before? A long time ago. It's called the sawmill. I know. Johnny? Yeah? Are you glad you met me? <laughs> so far, yeah. <laughs> Is this part of the routine? <laughs> This was the type of situation with which I wasn't too familiar. Grace Whitehead was quite a doll. She was more than pretty, and in the bright moonlight that flooded the Sawmill River Parkway, there was something starry-eyed about her. I was driving her car. It was a European sports model. There was no traffic on the parkway, and it was tough trying to hold my speed down to a sensible 60 miles. So when Grace started to cry about nothing in particular, I kept my eyes on the road. I figured she knew what she was crying about, and if she wanted to talk about it, she would. I'm sorry, Johnny. Feeling better? I don't know. Anything you want to talk about? No. Okay. I was being silly. Why not? Johnny, you take the next exit. All right. We're nearly there, Johnny. Along this lane? It's a big place. I mean a lot of grounds. The house isn't so big, but they have about 50 acres of land, a lot of woods. Well, you just tell me where to turn in here. We're coming to a gateway. Ah, uh, on the right? Yes, there it is. Turn in there. It's a long driveway. Mm-hmm. Nobody home. There must be. And they're in bed. No, Johnny, they expect me. No sign of any lights. Well, maybe they're at the back. Oh, come on, let's ring the bell. And we are expected. Oh, yes. Huh? It's only 8 o'clock. Besides, Dora must be home. Who's Dora? Mrs. Vostick. Ring the bell, Johnny. Okay. Nobody home. Well, there must be. If you say so. Let's try the door. They wouldn't go out and leave the door unlocked. Just see if it's open, Johnny. Okay. So I was wrong. Let's go in. Sure. We'll play this one the way it's being dealt. I'll put on a light. We 
can wait in the living room, across there. Oh, nice place. There's a bar in the corner if you want to fix a drink. Just make ourselves at home, huh? You fix a drink while I go upstairs. I'm sure Dora must be here. Why? Well, she's a sick girl. She spends her time in bed. There was nothing yet that fell into any kind of a pattern. I fixed a couple of drinks while I waited for Grace to come back downstairs. While I fixed them, I started thinking about the girl who might be upstairs, a sick wife who spent all of her time in bed. What possible connection did she have with the mysterious advertisement I'd answered? It was a good question, but I had no answer for it. She's not in her room. Is that unusual? I just don't understand. Well, it's easy. She's out. I don't get it. I don't get it, Johnny. You don't get what? I was expected. They left the door open for you. Well, I know. Well, but... maybe they're calling on neighbors and they'll be back any minute now. Could be that. What else? Johnny, let's go. Why? Please, Johnny, please. Please do as I say. Here, you have a drink there. I don't want it. Let's get out of here. You're... you're scared. I know I am. Scared of what? Johnny, don't ask crazy questions. Just let's get out of here. You want to answer it? No. Somebody should. No, let it ring. It could be your friend. Let it ring. Let's see who it is, Grace. No. Hello? Hello, Mr. Steele. Well, what do you know? Two things, Mr. Steele. Oh, at least two, yeah. Your salary. You are interested in that. Who isn't? I will meet you tomorrow and will give you $1,000. For doing what? For not asking questions, Mr. Steele. It's a habit I have. I will telephone you at the Explorers Club at noon tomorrow. Just why am I at this house tonight? The answer lies at the back of the house. Where? Go out the back door. Walk about 500 yards along a path that leads through the woods. Until I see what? A summer house. I see. Go into the summer house and wait there. How long? We'll know when you get there. And when am I supposed to go there? At exactly 8.30. Leave the house. 8.30. Okay. Who was it, Johnny? Don't you know? Someone who knew you were here. Yeah. How about that? I don't know. I, I just don't know. I'm scared. Please, let's get out of here. Look, what's it all about? I can't tell you. I'm supposed to take a walk through the woods. Don't go. Why not? Johnny, please, let's get out of here. You brought me here. It was part of a plan. I want to know the answer, baby. Johnny, Johnny, please, let's go, please. It's 8.30, and I'm taking that walk. No, 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 no. What's out there in the summer house? Nothing. Nothing? Oh, I can't let it happen, Johnny. I can't let it happen to you. You want to talk about it? You're just not the kind of guy I expected to meet. No? You're nice. You're too nice, Johnny. Is that good or bad? Oh. You're supposed to go to the summer house and wait there. Yeah, that's right. And as soon as you leave, I'm supposed to drive away and leave you here. Then what? After a while, you get tired of waiting in the summer house and come back here. And you'd be gone? She'd be here in this living room. Who? Dora, his wife. I see. Only she'd be dead, strangled to death. While you're out of the house, he'll bring her in here and leave her here for you to find. You mean... I'm supposed to be framed for a murder. Yes. Let me take it. Yes? Hello? <laughs> what is it? I know you told me not to telephone, but I'm so lonely, darling. Can't I come home? Dora? Who is this? The dame at the other end was sick. She sounded very weak. I was sure it was Dora Vostick, the gal who should have been upstairs in bed. She was also the gal who, according to plan, was supposed to be brought into the house after I went out and then murdered. Something was not going according to plan. Dora, it must have been her, Johnny. She wants to come home. Here. Bostick is not with her. This is not the way he had it planned. 
if I was to be the patsy for her death. I don't get it. I don't get it. Bostick should be here any minute now. But if Dora's not with him... Forget Dora. He'll be here. Sit down and wait. I'll be in the next room. When he comes, don't let him know I'm here. <clears throat> Someone just came into the house. Now, don't be scared. Hello, Grace. You forgot the plan? Did you forget? The original plan had been very impersonal. Vostick had a sick wife. He wanted to get rid of her. When it happened, it would look as if a man had entered the house while she was there alone and had killed her. The house was lonely, surrounded by woods. All Vostick needed was a patsy to frame for the murder. That was where I came in. While I was out taking that walk through the woods, Vostick would secretly enter the house with his wife, kill her, then vanish. And my fingerprints would be all over the place, and I had no way of tracing my reason for being there to him. My star witness, Grace Whitehead, according to plan, would have disappeared. It was real cute. Only something had either gone wrong or plans had been changed. I kept out of sight when Vostick came into the house. He forgot his accent. I'm surprised to find you here, Grace. I know, I... You should have left some minutes ago. Paul, listen. No, dear. You listen to me. You scare me. Do I? Oh, please don't. Steel is not here. No. <laughs> Poor fellow. Look, Paul... You know, you've carried out your part very well, Grace. Very well, indeed. Well, I know, Only but... You should have left here by now. In your car. Oh, Paul, you're hurting me. Of course, you would have encountered me along the driveway. You're hurting. Grace, I changed my mind, you see. About Dora? I decided against killing her for you. I'm glad. Oh, Paul, you've no idea how glad I am. I really am. Oh, don't kid me, Grace. I mean it. You mean you're scared. Oh, Paul, you do scare me. You're not a very nice girl, Grace. You're going to be a party to what they call murder. I didn't want to go through with it. Didn't you? No, I didn't, really. What a shame you have Let to. me go, Paul. Please don't hold me so tight. See, when you didn't show up along that driveway, I didn't wait for you. I came to you instead. Paul, what's the matter with you? I was waiting along that driveway to kill you. What? I was going to kill you out there. Kill me? Instead of my wife. Oh, no, Paul, no, oh, no. Oh, I must. Let me go. I will in just a few moments, Grace. You're crazy. You see, you knew this house was empty. You came here with a strange man you'd picked up, this fellow Steele. And he killed you. You couldn't get away with that, Paul. Oh, yes, I can. Paul, your wife telephoned here. Huh? She spoke to John Steele. Does she know who he is? No, then but... Then she knows a strange man was in the house. That helps me quite a lot, Grace. Why would you want to kill me? Well, you could prove an embarrassment, Grace. No, I no. couldn't trust you. Oh, you could? No, my dear, it's better this way. No one can connect you with me. No one ever saw us together... You were always much too careful. I'm sorry, Grace. This is the only solution. It'll all be over in a moment. That'll do, chump. What? I'm John Steele, the guy. Oh, you swine, you... I've never prided myself on being a world beater when it came to trading punches. Usually, I do okay, and I'm used to roughing it up with the various characters I run into. I don't always come out on top. This was one of those occasions. Paul Vostick, with or without an accent, was a tough boy. Tough enough that he took me by surprise, and I landed in one corner of his living room with a chair wrapped around my skull. By the time I was through with my unrehearsed astronomical observations, Vostick was out in the driveway, running for his own car. Johnny? Where did I pick you up? Are you all right, Johnny? I'll tell you in a minute. He was going to kill me. Yeah. Are you all right? Come on, let's go riding. Well, where? Somewhere to settle unfinished business. Come on. Johnny, let him go. I haven't even caught up with him yet. Well, don't go after him. Okay, you stay here. No. 
And get in. Johnny, I'm scared. You should be. Johnny, I changed my mind. You saw I didn't want to go through with it. I didn't want him to hurt his wife. You reformed just in time to save your conscience. I must have been crazy. Yeah. Johnny. What? I fell for you. I didn't want him anymore. He could have his wife. I didn't want him anymore. I sent him a telegram. Don't you understand, Johnny? It's you I want, not him. There he is. That must be him right ahead. Johnny, you're doing 85 miles an hour. The only way to overtake your boyfriend. He's not my boyfriend. Did he buy you this car? No. He should have. It's quite a bus. You're a crazy guy, aren't you, Johnny? We'll pass him in just ten seconds. You're going to force him to stop? If he doesn't, there'll be quite a wreck. His brakes work real good. All right, chum. Let's make it round two. Listen, you fool. Later. <coughs> I could take you, Warstick. Now you want to try for the jackpot? Let me alone. You were going to kill this girl. She'd have destroyed my life. She wanted me to give up everything I had for her. My wife. Everything. She threatened me a couple of times. I planned it. Oh, I was out of my mind. Johnny, let's go back to New York, please. Yeah, it's where you made your big entrance into my life. That's why you better make your exit, baby. He's crazy, Johnny. I don't care about him anymore. It's you now. Get in the car. Do you live in New York, Johnny? No. I'm strictly a foreigner, baby. From Timbuktu. And believe me, I'm on my way back there. first day and evening in New York was not my idea of a restful change. I walked around New York City studying people's faces and, well, they looked worried about something, but they didn't look scared. Me, I was scared. The morning after I picked up Grace, I realized I'd been driving her car without a driving license. When my back mail was delivered to me, I found a notice from the income tax people. They wanted to see me about something. I should have stood in Africa. You meet some crazy people there, too. So, friends, be around next week, huh? For an adventure that took place in Bartown. Population unlisted. A fly speck on the map. It's a real adventure I like to call Junk Mine. Heard with me on today's transcribed John Steele adventure were Mary Ashworth and Ross Martin. I'm Don Douglas. So, until next week, then, and Junk Mine. Remember, adventure is where you find it. But don't look for it. It may find you. John Steele, Adventurer, was brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.